Hi everyone. Welcome back to my channel. In this video, we're going to take a look into high profile mob killings. The murders were much more frequent and equally graphic in the first half of the 20th century, when the mob ruled supreme and was a mainstay of front page news, fueling the macabre imaginations of the American public. Here are the most famous mob killings. Paul Big Polly Castellano utilized his astute business acumen to propel the Gambino crime family to unprecedented financial heights. He steered the family away from illicit enterprises such as drug trafficking, opting instead for more relatively secure practices such as money laundering and extortion, which were deemed less risky for the criminal organization. Despite his primary focus on the business aspect, Castellano displayed no hesitancy in ordering hits, especially when it involved his own daughter, Constance. Legend has it that in 1975, Castellano allegedly commanded the execution of Constance's boyfriend, Vito Borelli, following a disrespectful encounter that deeply offended him. Furthermore, when Castellano discovered that Constance's ex-husband, Frank Amato, had been mistreating her, he reportedly had Amato gruesomely disposed of by dismembering his body and disposing of it in the vast ocean. Nevertheless, as is often the case with individuals exposed to immense wealth and influence, Castellano's ambition grew insatiable. In 1981, he constructed an extravagant 17-room mansion on Staten Island, meticulously designed to resemble the iconic White House. Concurrently, Castellano's demands for a larger share of the mob's profits escalated, causing discontent within the organization. Gambino capo John Gotti, dissatisfied with Castellano's leadership and management of the syndicate, orchestrated a group of individuals who ambushed and assassinated Castellano as he was entering Manhattan's famed Spark Steakhouse for a dinner engagement in 1985. This act of violence plunged the Gambino family into disarray and marked the initiation of its gradual decline. Next is the murder is Benjamin Bugsy Siegel. Siegel defied the traditional image of a clandestine gangster operating in the shadows. With his striking looks and magnetic personality, he became one of the first high-profile mobsters to capture the attention of the media. As a Jewish-American crime boss, he played a pivotal role in shaping the iconic Las Vegas Strip. Siegel's ventures were far from discreet, including his involvement in the notorious murder, Incorporated, a business he co-founded alongside fellow mobster Meyer Lansky in New York. Starting from humble beginnings in the crime-ridden borough of Brooklyn, Siegel eventually found himself rubbing shoulders with the rich and famous in Hollywood. However, his flamboyant and headline-grabbing lifestyle came to a violent end in Beverly Hills in 1947. Following the repeal of Prohibition in 1933, Siegel shifted his focus to the lucrative realm of gambling and saw great potential in establishing a gambling paradise in the Nevada desert. He relocated to California, where he set up gambling establishments and offshore gambling ships, while also expanding into drug trafficking, prostitution, and bookmaking. Acquiring an opulent mansion in Beverly Hills, Siegel reveled in a lavish existence, socializing with movie stars and influential figures. He also embarked on a romantic relationship with Virginia Hill, the glamorous former lover of Luciano family capo Joe Adonis. In 1945, the couple ventured to Las Vegas with the intention of turning Siegel's gambling vision into a reality. When the construction of the Flamingo Hotel on the Vegas Strip faced financial challenges, Siegel capitalized on the opportunity, injecting funds from his connections within the Eastern Crime Syndicate. However, as the budget soared from $1.5 million to over $6 million, suspicions arose among his fellow gangsters, who correctly believed that Siegel was squandering vast sums on his extravagant lifestyle. Among those infuriated by this betrayal was Siegel's former partner, Meyer Lansky. On the night of June 20, 1947, Siegel was reading the Los Angeles Times in his girlfriend's Beverly Hills home when a hail of bullets pierced through the window, ending his life. Although no one was officially charged with his murder, which remains an unsolved crime, it is widely believed that Siegel's misappropriation and mishandling of funds at the Flamingo ultimately sealed his fate. Allegedly, a meeting of the mob syndicate that had loaned him money for the hotel, including Lansky and Charles Lucky Luciano, decided to execute him, placing a contract on his head. The day after Siegel's assassination, three associates of Lansky took control of the Flamingo. Another theory suggests that Matthew Moose Panja, an associate of Siegel's Las Vegas partner Mo Sedway, preemptively killed him. It was rumored that B. Sedway, Moe's wife, had discovered Siegel's plans to eliminate her husband to prevent him from uncovering allegations of theft from the mob. While the Flamingo may have marked the catalyst for Siegel's downfall, his legacy endures at the iconic Las Vegas landmark. A plaque honoring him can be found at the casino, nestled between the pool and a wedding chapel, ensuring that he is never forgotten. Next murder is Angelo Bruno, the esteemed leader of the Philadelphia crime family. 
Bruno earned the moniker Gentle Don due to his preference for utilizing bribery rather than resorting to murder as a means of negotiation. He maintained a strong aversion to violence and even exiled one of his associates, Nico Demo Little Nicky Scarfo, to Atlantic City due to Scarfo's excessively brutal nature. Bruno aimed to minimize the family's involvement in drug trafficking, focusing on other avenues of operation. However, not everyone within the organization shared Bruno's peaceful approach. His trusted consigliere, Antonio Caponegro, held a contrasting view and expressed his dissatisfaction with Bruno's restrictions on drug-related activities. Caponegro felt that these limitations hindered his potential for lucrative profits. In an act of betrayal, Caponegro orchestrated a hit against Bruno in March 1980 resulting in a shotgun blast to the back of Bruno's head while he was in his car. Since Capo Negro had acted without authorization from the mafia's governing body, the commission, his disrespectful violation of rank and proper procedures could not go unpunished. Frank Thierry, a close friend and co-conspirator of Capo Negro, betrayed him. As a consequence, Capo Negro faced the wrath of Joe Mad Dog Sullivan, who shot him while he was parked outside his residence in Philadelphia. Capo Negro's body was later discovered in the trunk of a car in the South Bronx, exhibiting 14 bullet and knife wounds. To symbolize his greed, approximately $300 was found stuffed into his mouth and anus. The brutal demise of both Bruno and Capo Negro highlighted the consequences of disrespecting the established hierarchy and protocols of the mafia. It served as a grim reminder that betrayal within the criminal organization would not go unpunished. Renowned by aliases such as Mad Hatter and Lord High Executioner, Anastasia holds the gruesome distinction of orchestrating a reign of terror throughout the 1930s and 1940s, cementing his position as one of the FBI's most notorious and deadliest criminals. Emerging as one of the leaders of Murder Incorporated, a notorious group of contract killers that operated covertly from the back of a Brooklyn candy store, Anastasia established his prominence within the criminal underworld. Anastasia's ascent to power reached a pivotal point with his alleged involvement in the assassination of the Gambino family boss, a strategic move that likely propelled him further within the ranks. In 1951, amid escalating tensions between New York City's five families, the prominent mob organizations, Anastasia assumed the position of Don within the crime family. The circumstances surrounding Anastasia's demise remain shrouded in uncertainty. However, it is widely believed that his assassination was ordered by a rival crime family. In October 1957, Anastasia, seeking a routine shave and haircut, reclined in his barber's chair, unaware of the impending danger. Two masked assailants suddenly appeared, opening fire upon him. Surprised and attempting to defend himself, Anastasia lunged at his attackers, grasping futilely at their reflections in the mirror adorning the wall. As the assailants continued to unleash a hail of bullets, Anastasia's life ebbed away, the shocking scene made all the more vivid by his bloodied form draped in pristine white towels. The brazen murder captivated the public's imagination, fueling widespread curiosity and intrigue. The next one is the Galante murder, a seasoned member of the Bonino family, earned the nickname The Cigar due to his notable fondness for smoking cigars. In 1974, following the imprisonment of Bonino leader Philip Rusty Rustelli, Galante capitalized on the power vacuum and seized control. Having served as the family's underboss for an extended period, Galante believed himself to be the rightful successor. However, his ascent to the top position did not receive the approval of the commission, the governing body overseeing the major mob families. Galante's forceful bid to monopolize the narcotics market without sharing profits with the other five families caused discontent among the ranks, particularly with Genovese family boss Frank Thierry. Thierry lodged a complaint with the commission, arguing against Galante's illegitimate rise to the leadership of the Bonino family. The commission concurred with Thierry's plea, leading to the decision to eliminate Galante. In July 1979, while enjoying a meal at Joe and Mary's Italian-American restaurant in Brooklyn, Galante met his demise. Gunman, acting on behalf of the commission, ambushed and gunned him down. The infamous image captured during the incident depicts Galante with a cigar still dangling from his mouth, forever frozen in time. The assassination of Galante served as a stern reminder that unauthorized power plays and refusal to adhere to the established rules of the criminal underworld would not be tolerated. It symbolized the swift and decisive consequences awaiting those who attempted to defy the hierarchy and infringe upon the interests of the other mob families. And the last murders is brothers Anthony the Ant Spilatro, aged 48, and Michael Spilatro, aged 41. On a fateful day, Saturday June 14, 1986, they met a tragic end at the hands of their underworld associates. Their lives were brutally cut short in the basement of a residence in Bensonville, Illinois. It was not until nine days later that their remains were discovered, 
buried in a cornfield in Indiana. Nicholas Calabrese, a member of the outfit who later became an informant, provided authorities with valuable information about the events leading to the Spilatro brothers' demise. According to Calabrese, the brothers had been summoned to a meeting on June 14, in the afternoon, by Chicago bosses. Leaving Michael's townhouse in Oak Park, Illinois, around 2 o'clock, they embarked on the journey in Michael's 1986 Lincoln Continental. The meeting took place in the basement of a residence in Bensonville, a suburb in DuPage County, near O'Hare International Airport. James Marcello, a key figure, guided them to the location. The stated purpose of the meeting was supposedly to promote Michael Spilatro from an outfit associate to a full member. However, the brothers harbored apprehensions due to their previous schemes against outfit bosses. Michael, expressing his concerns to his wife, mentioned that if he did not return home by 9 o'clock that night, something was amiss. Despite their reservations, the brothers arrived at the meeting unarmed. Upon their arrival, they were ambushed by Nicholas Calabrese and other mobsters. Calabrese later recalled the presence of individuals such as James La Pietra, John Ficarata, John No Nos Di Franzo, Sam Wings Carlisi, Louis the Mucheboli, James Marcello, Louis Marino, Joseph Ferriola, and Ernest Rocky Infalize during the attack. Calabrese described how he immobilized Michael Spilatro by holding his legs while others subjected him to a brutal beating and strangulation. Anthony Spilatro, in his final moments, made a desperate plea for a moment to say a prayer, but his request fell on deaf ears. He too was mercilessly beaten until his life was extinguished. Ficarata and other individuals were entrusted with disposing of the brothers' bodies. They transported the bodies approximately 75 miles southeast of Bensonville, reaching the outskirts of Enos in Newton County, Indiana. There, the brothers' bodies, stripped down to their underwear, were buried in a shallow grave atop one another in a cornfield that had been recently planted. Okay, that's it for now. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more character breakdowns and analysis of your favorite gangsters. See you in the next one.